Muy buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos a nuestro nuevo webinar con Fred Boyle. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We have with our uh, new presenter, Fred Boyle. Vamos a esperar unos minutos a que se conecte la, las personas. Ya se están conectando. Bienvenidos. We're going to wait a few minutes for everybody to connect. Okay. Let's see how many participants. Okay. There's Sunny. 27. Up. Greetings from Colombia. You can see uh, Fred in the chat part. Ah, you yes. can see the uh, greetings. Yeah. Juan Moreno. Toma. Buenos días a todos. Gracias por conectarse. Muchas gracias. Okay, 32, it's coming up. Se están conectando poco a poco, 34. Muy bien. Vamos. From Guadalajara. Ah, no, Guatemala, Mexico. Mm. Mexico, said so Guatemala. Yeah, we'll see. But it's still... Uh... A few minutes before. Yeah, start. we need to wait a little bit. Yeah. Desde Guatemala, saludos. Muchas gracias. We have 36. Let's wait a little bit. From Cuernavaca, this is this is Mexico, not Guatemala. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. This is from Ecuador. Wow, great. 40 presenters. So we're going to wait until they're like a, over a hundred and something. Let's see if they sign up quickly. Oh, it's not uh, It's not 11 yet. Uh, it's still, uh, Two minutes it's before the time. Before yeah, the, the yeah. Time is, uh, wait a little bit. From Colombia again. Yeah. We have a few fans from Colombia, Fred. Yes. <laughs> You can watch the video in the meanwhile of uh, the tagging that we did in 2009. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was 2009, yeah. 2009 and 12, I think. Yeah. Portugal. From Portugal, waiting for you in the Azores. Yeah. Pedro, Pedro Almeida. Mm. Okay, 44. Okay, it's coming up. <clears throat> Amisub, buenos días. Muchas gracias. Yeah, we're slowly connecting. Let's wait a little bit. Yes, yes. Since uh, still early. Still, more or less early, at least in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that. Do you remember that chat, Fred? Nice. Uh, Screen puff. Yeah. It's the one with a lot of uh, birthmarks in both sides. Yes, yes. Oh, look at that. It has something in, in the... <laughs> they call that Noriega because of the white nose. <laughs> like the drug dealer. <laughs> Noriega. <laughs> oh, that's Vela. That's Did, you Vela. After? Did you see it afterwards? Or? Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have. Okay. Because I haven't nice. seen it uh, after that. So... Yeah, it's, I mean, every year it's different. Yeah. yeah. But okay. we have seen a lot of juveniles. Lanzarote, Spain. Wow. Oh. Connecting from all over. 53. Yes, we will, we will share the post recording of this session in our YouTube channel. Yes. 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 56. Yeah, this guy Pedro Almeida is asking. Yes, we're going to share we'll share all of the presentations. Uh, yeah. That will be later today or tomorrow. Okay. You're welcome. Good. Okay, 63. Okay, so it's 11 in La Paz, 5 p.m. Hey, for you. James, why, why don't you explain about the Q&A and the chat and all that? Yes, okay. So, yeah, while we're waiting... 
we have uh, two sections where you can send comments. We have the chat and we have the Q&A. Uh, your questions, send them to Q&A. Tenemos dos lugares para enviar preguntas, el chat y, bueno, enviar comentarios, el chat y preguntas y respuestas. Las preguntas, eh, mándenlas principalmente a la sección de preguntas y respuestas, o Q&A en inglés. Eh, vamos a empezar en cuatro minutos. Four more minutes, uh, Fred, 71. Ok. Slowly but surely. Almost ready. Ya casi listos. De La Paz, México. Yes. It's so crazy what? how much these uh, webinars have developed since uh, yeah. that uh, crazy virus. Huh? <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting. It's a very different way to work, but it works. So It works, and it's a great way to connect to people, and oh, it's yeah. awesome. Greetings from Germany. Wow, Guatemala. Guatemala. Yeah, and also how much money they're making, these guys, these webinars, yes. companies. Yes. yes. They're booming. And the funny UK. thing, so many people were uh, complaining before that it doesn't work, we cannot do that, you need to fly people all over, over the world to do a one-hour meeting. And, you know, mm -hmm. these e-meetings never work, and now everybody's doing that. And everybody's exactly. working from home, and it works. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think Very a lot of in-person meetings are just going to stop. There are going to be a lot of uh, more of these. I mean, you know, yeah. crossing an ocean to have a three-hour meeting and then flying back. back. I think that's done. Huh? Yes, yeah. so. yeah. it is true. It is true. And that will uh, help in the foot, uh, carbon footprint. Yes. Excellent. Look, greetings from Ireland, Mexico City, UK. Nice. <laughs> Scotland. Scotland. Whoa. Oh, it's MT. MT saying greetings. Paul oh, Bukovic. Hi, MT. Paul Bukovic from Scotland. Oh, Scotland. remember Paul? We went to Clarion with him. The oh. three yeah. Paul Bukovic. Good friend. Last King Charles are here. Wow. Take pictures. Yeah, please, Paul, send some pictures. Norway. Norway. Wow. Victoria yeah. Egger. Germany also. Wow, a lot of people. Love. Oh, Brazil. From Brazil. No Brazil. <laughs> Gabriela. Okay, we're going to start in a couple minutes. 94 participants already. Rachel says BBC, they may be in Azores. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Yeah, we discussed last week. Oh, really? You uh, talked to the other guys? Yeah, we search it next year, maybe. Thanks, Paul. Or, Thanks for letting us know. 98. Okay, one minute will start. Okay. So Fred, Fred, if something happens, uh, we will send you an email. If we lose you and we cannot see you or hear you, we will send you an email. Uh, can okay. you check that? Because you don't have a mobile, right? You don't, you don't have. Yeah, but I shut it down. I shut it down. Okay. Okay, perfect. So check we will email. let you know by email. Check your emails just in case the connection fails, because you never know. Okay. Technology can fail and has yeah. happened okay. before. So, uh, and it happened with Sandra that she was talking, 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 and we had to, she had to rewind because she was not talking. Oh, to really? Anybody. Okay. She had to go back several slides. So, yeah, okay. just make sure that uh, you're connected. We'll let you know. And okay, but so I connect. Uh... Yeah. So we'll be, uh, our microphones will be shot uh, dur during your presentation. So... From Colombia, Felipe. Hello, Felipe. Ah. Yes. Felipe was with us on the last Malpelo expedition. Nice. Yeah. Look, from Austria, I'm Fred Mauricio, Florian. Hi, Florian, how are you? <laughs> That's nice. Okay, how many do you have? 107. Should we give it one more minute? Okay, one okay. more minute. Okay, let's do that. Mm hmm. 
Brazil again. I oh, know that was that was older. Jalapa, Veracruz. Mariano Ortiz. Yeah. More European crowd this time. Costa Rica. Yeah, it's a good time, mate. Right? I mean, it's yeah, it's seven o'clock on the mainland in Europe. Yes, it's a great time. So, uh, they have to choose between uh, dinner or the web dinner. Dinner or watching <laughs> bread. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Except in Southern Europe, because they eat later, so maybe they can have the webinar and then dinner. Oh, they have a uh, late dinner. Yeah, you're right, like 10 p.m., right? And Germans and Austrian already ate two, two hours ago, so that's okay. <laughs> you're always early. Yeah. Oh, from Vienna. Again, Florian. Nice. Desde La Paz. Desde La Paz. Rebeca. Ah, hola, Rebeca. Yes. Okay. So... Let's see how many we have. 111. Is that a good number? Yes. Good. Okay. Okay. So we're going to start. Ready, guys? Are you going to say the biography, James? Yes, I'm going to say that. Okay. Listos. Muy buenos días. Bienvenidos al webinar con Fred Boyle. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Este webinar va a ser en inglés. Eh, desgraciadamente no hay tiempo de hacer una traducción simultánea porque nos han preguntado en otras ocasiones. Entonces va a ser en inglés. Las preguntas sí podemos traducir algunas cosas. So, webinar in English. Uh, welcome, Fred. Bienvenido, Fred. Voy a, hacer un, eh, voy a leer el, eh, la biografía de Fred en inglés. I'm going to read uh, Fred's bio in English. So, uh, Fred Boyle is a professional free diver. He said his first world record in 1995, and, and then decided to dedicate his life to free diving. He achieved three more world records between 97 and 2000. In 99, Frederick, Frederick passed the 100 meter medical barrier on the breath, in one breath of air, being the eighth person to do so. In 2002, he started underwater photography to show the beauty of free diving and the underwater world. To take his pictures and video, Fred uses a simple formula, the water, available light, a camera, and one breath of air. Nothing more, nothing less. A free diver is able to capture unique moments thanks to his simple equipment and ease of movement. Fred has been taking pictures down to 60 meters on a single breath of air and on remote locations where light logistics makes all the difference. Concerned by conservation and environmental issues for many years, in 2005, he started to work with marine biologists around the world to assist them in their field work deploying acoustic and satellite tags and taking DNA samples. We met Fred in 2006 in a shark research expedition to Malpelo Island with a team that later founded Migomar. Since then, Fred has been, has, has been helping us to tag different species of sharks in the Galapagos Islands, Reviajedo, Cabo Pulmo, and Guadalupe Island. Fred, you're very welcome. Thank you very much to be here. And it's all yours. Thank, thanks a lot. Thank you guys for uh, welcoming me here uh, today. It's always a pleasure to uh, interact with you. And um, wait, uh, I need to see how that works because of course I cannot make it work now. So, uh, wait. I cannot. Ah, okay, sorry guys. Uh, so yeah, always a pleasure to, to be here with you. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, my journey into uh, conservation and helping scientists on the, on the field. Uh, so basically, uh, I started free diving when I was a little kid. I started when I was eight or nine years old. Because since uh, I was able to, uh, to watch movies or read books, I wanted to explore the underwater world. And the most natural way was free diving, of course. So I started at a very early age uh, with snorkeling, then a bit of spearfishing, and then I was totally hooked. And uh, when I was in my teenage years, I was doing a bit of scuba diving as well, but free diving was still the drive. And I started to train a lot. And uh, when I was 20, 21 years old, uh, I quit everything, school, job, and uh, embarked into uh, becoming a, a professional athlete as a free diver. That lasted 10 years from 94 to 2004. And uh, so some records and, and a lot of uh, really cool experiences. And then um, 
two years before I stopped uh, competing, I bought my first underwater camera. And uh, that the idea behind that was just to take pictures and memories of the friends and the competition. And, uh, but quickly I started to be able to sell these pictures. So I, I embarked into a second career, uh, still as a free diver, but not competitive free diver anymore, underwater photographer. And of course, when you are an underwater photographer, you look for stories. And uh, at some point, when you follow free divers on a competition, it's always, you know, free diver going down the line, up the line, it's a bit boring. So you look for other stories. And, uh, and then I started to get more and more interested into what marine biologists were doing, because that makes a really good story. And then uh, in 2005, I was asked if a free diver could be helpful uh, to tag sharks. And uh, that's how I got some bark on an expedition to Malpelo, where I met uh, James. Uh, and we, we started to, uh, to tag sharks. And uh, that was the beginning of my journey into uh, marine biology and helping scientists on the field. So here, this picture was taken in, uh, in Malpelo Island during one of these expeditions. Uh, you can see the, the, the amount of, uh, of sharks we have there. And that's uh, a picture I, I really like. You can see our host James here, uh, young James. It was back in 2006. Uh, then uh, you can see Sandra Besulo who was managing uh, the Malpelo Marine Preserve Mar uh, National Park in Colombia. We did a lot to protect that, that area. And in the middle, you can see uh, the famous uh, Dr. Peter Klimley, uh, who is in one of the pioneers of shark research, the first guy to use telemetry and tagging sharks back in the 70s in the Gulf of California. And uh, during that first expedition, he was there to teach us how to use all these telemetric tools and uh, helping, him, helping us to know more about that. Uh, it was an epic trip because he's an epic personality. Uh, but we learned a lot. And uh, since then, we, we, we developed it. And uh, during that trip, like James said before, uh, we had Alex Earn from um, the Galapagos. And after that, Migramar uh, emerged uh, with the, the desire to be able to combine the conservation efforts between the nation of the, the Eastern Pacific uh, to, in order to protect the, the sharks in a, in a more efficient way. So here we have the water of Malpelo on a clear day. Uh, so of course in Malpelo we've mainly worked with um, hammerhead sharks, scalloped hammerhead sharks, but also in Malpelo there is a very specific shark. It's one of the only place in the world where you can dive with them because they go quite shallow. It's the ferox shark. And uh, we were able to tag these, uh, these animals too. Uh, very interesting sharks, very impressive sharks. It's a very prehistoric looking animal. Here you can see one we tag with two tags. There is a satellite uh, mini pad tag and an acoustic tag. Uh, but those animals we were not tagging on uh, free diving because they were very deep. I think that animal we tagged at 92 meter on scuba. So don't try that in, at home. So here is the, um, a little uh, poster showing uh, the, the, what the shark we tagged in 2006 in Malpelo. We could place uh, six or seven um, satellite tags. And that's where the, all these animals went. And that's where I realized uh, how useful that uh, work could be. Because you can see on that picture that even though we tagged them in Malpelo, they were going in all the area. They were going to Galapagos, to uh, Costa Rica and Cocos Island, to the mainland Colombia, mainly the big females, probably to give birth in the mangrove. So when you see that picture, you can understand how valuable the data collected by marine scientists can be useful in order to establish uh, marine protected areas and also um, how practical these information are because usually people see uh, marine biology as something very theoretical, uh, studying things that are not really useful. 
but uh, mainly we, we can have practical knowledge uh, with what we gather during these expeditions. So extremely useful for conservation. So when I arrived um, in Malpelo in 2006, the equipment we had was very basic. It didn't really evolve since the 1970s. And with my background as a freediver and um, a spearfisher, uh, I started to modify uh, spearfishing equipment, something more light, more accurate. And uh, we developed with a manufacturer in South Africa, with Rob Allen, um, darts and tags, uh, and lines between the tags and um, the darts uh, that were a bit more evolved with new material, a new approach to the thing. So that's always, um, always fun to be able to develop the equipment and specific equipment. Now I'm going to show you a short video. Uh, it's kind of a compilation of um, uh, free diving action tagging. Uh, so you see we do some biopsies in South Africa with black tip sharks. We tag hammerhead sharks, we tag great hammerhead sharks, white sharks. So you have an idea of how it works underwater free diving to tag a shark. Uh, so it's a short two minutes uh, video. I'm a bit cheeky. Okay, so uh, you had um, an idea of uh, all the animals you can tag uh, using free diving. Um, so here I start uh, to, to, to go a little more in depth uh, with the, the great hammerhead of uh, the Bahamas in, in Bimini. 
uh, probably the, the best place in the world to, to work with sharks. Imagine a crystal clear water, seven or eight meter deep maximum, white sand reflecting the light, so it's uh, the perfect place. Uh, we worked with uh, the, the Great Amred with acoustic tagging and uh, satellite tagging as well. Uh, here you can see, it's a, that's a picture I took when a free diver is uh, putting the, the tag on the, on the shark and see the, the shark just received the tag and is about to, to leave. So the methodology is very simple. Huh? It's a modified uh, uh, spear from a spear gun, a normal spear gun, uh, with a little less power, of course. And uh, the, the shaft is going to uh, put a little dart that's approximately between two and a half and three centimeters into the, the muscle of the shark. And uh, then the shaft uh, removes itself and the shark swims uh, freely with just the tag inserted. So very uh, efficient way. You don't need to fish the animal out of the water. Uh, it's, uh, it's better for the animal somehow. But that's a picture uh, showing a, a big uh, female with an acoustic tag uh, near its fin and a receiver uh, because you always need a tag and a receiver in order to, to study these animals. And uh, for me, it was a very important picture. Uh, it's the first time I was able to have a shark with a tag and a receiver. It took me days to get that picture. I spent hours and hours near that receiver uh, in order to have uh, at some point to be able to snap the pick uh, with that uh, large female passing by. Uh, so it doesn't look like it, but uh, it was a very important picture for me. So um, now next step, we, we go to Guadalupe Island, a very special place. Uh, I started uh, going there in 2009 uh, with Mauricio. And uh, we were shooting a, a documentary for a, a German uh, TV production. And before going there, I, I got in touch with Mauricio and asking him if Freediver could be helpful for him to, uh, to help him in his tagging work. And uh, so he said, yeah, why not? We can try. And during that trip, we tagged a few sharks. And um, in fact, the advantage we had at, as Freedivers to tag sharks, um, instead of doing it from the boat, is that Freediver can really choose the sharks. So we could, if Mauricio was telling us, okay, tag young males, tag big females, we could really pick the shark we needed to tag and, uh, and then making the, the whole operation a bit more um, efficient. And uh, so that's how we did. Uh, of course, the first time you get in the water uh, to tag a white shark, you always wonder how the shark will react. Uh, and I must say, the first time I, I put a tag on a shark with a spear gun, it was in Malpelo with a, a, a regular size scalloped hammerhead. I was always wondering how we would react. But to answer that question, in all these years, I probably tagged between 180 and 200 sharks uh, with that method and never had a shark uh, coming back uh, at me or turn around. So I guess it's exactly the same for you if someone in the street uh, pinch you with a needle or something, you won't turn around, uh, you will just run straight. So uh, that's to answer that question that people uh, ask me uh, very often. Here, uh, that's a new type of tag we started to work with a few years ago, like three years ago. Um, it's these multi-platform tags that allowed scientists to put different instruments on one tag and uh, the beauty of that methodology also is that it's totally non-invasive because the tag doesn't remain for a long period of time on the shark and it's uh, attached by a clamp on the dorsal fin. And uh, I must say since four or five years, I started to work a lot on these uh, non-invasive methodologies um, because I think it's very interesting because I think in, with these methods, uh, the free divers make total sense. It means we go in the water, get to know the animal, and very gently going to uh, put the tag on its back. And, uh, and then we can recover the tag uh, between a few hours later or a few days, depending how the tag is programmed. Then we download all the data from the tag we collect back, and we can restart, reload, and redeploy again. 
So it's uh, non-invasive. We can reuse the same tags over and over. So uh, it makes a lot of sense to use that uh, methodology. So I'm going to show you a short video of uh, the Guadalupe tagging. Uh, it's not only about the, the white shark tagging, but you can see also how we live there on the island on the, the very basic uh, living condition we have there at the camp. Uh, very basic, but uh, absolutely amazing place uh, to, to work. So you see, it's a very gentle way of uh, tagging a shark. Uh, you really need to get confident with the animal and then gently apply uh, the tag. So it's a, it's a very nice way to do it. So I first started with these non-invasive tagging methods here in the Azores where I live part of the year uh, with Georges Fontes, a local uh, marine biologist, who's also a free diver. And together we developed a methodology to uh, tag blue sharks. So I'm going to talk a bit about that now. So here in Azores, we have a very large population of blue sharks uh, during the summer months. Um, it's beautiful animals. Uh, here you can see um, a large adult, so around two and a half meter long. So it's pure pelagic sharks, uh, very nice, very inquisitive. So quite easy to work with and always in that uh, magnificent deep blue of the Azorean waters. So uh, again, it's a multi-sensor uh, tag uh, where we can put different modules. And uh, we had two ideas first to deploy these tags to attach them on the shark. First was with a clamp. Uh, we were clamping on the dorsal fin. And then uh, we went uh, with a more efficient way, which is a kind of, a, I can say, a collar or lasso. I'll show you in the short video um, that uh, that was the way uh, to go and we have a very good uh, success rate uh, we, we deploy uh, the tags for uh, 24 hours usually and uh, we cover them after we with the boat the day after uh, we charge uh, the tag download the data and then we deploy again so methodology is very simple you gain the confidence of the shark and uh, when you come close, you try to pass that lasso around its head. And uh, so it's always a game of cat and mouse. Uh, it's an interesting um, thing to do. And then uh, the tag remained on the, on the animal for 24 hours. Uh, for those who are worried, uh, if the, the shark gets stuck, the tag gets stuck somewhere, uh, the nylon will break. Uh, this um, a galvanic link that dissolve after a few hours and if you pull strongly on it it will break so no risk to arm the shark or to um, to have him uh, getting stuck in a fishing line or something like that so it's it's totally non-invasive 
And that was the, the first methodology we were using with a clamp, but the results were not uh, as good because it's, uh, the blue shark swims a lot. And so uh, the, the, the tags had a tendency to come up to the surface a bit too early. So here, a little video uh, of how it's done. So that was the first uh, idea with the clamps. And then the lasso, which is much more efficient and works perfectly well with blue sharks as they are very inquisitive and curious. Then we developed also uh, that methodology with uh, mobula rays because we have a very big uh, population of mobula rays in summer. They migrate from the tropical uh, Atlantic of the, the coast of uh, Eastern Africa to the Azores on the deep sea mount offshore. And um, so we did the same with the mobula rays and it works very well. And uh, we've been deploying these uh, tags on mobula for now three or four years and uh, could get very, very interesting data. They go very deep. They can go to 1300 meters uh, to hunt. Uh, their speed can reach six to seven uh, meters a second. Uh, very interesting. Also with the onboard camera, we could um, notice one of the ray was pregnant. You could see the, the little rays inside the, the belly with the, um, the onboard camera. Very interesting uh, thing we could get. So same methodology as the shark, uh, coming above the, the ray and simply pass the, the lasso around the neck. Totally non-invasive technology. Okay, so also uh, beside the sharks, uh, I work sometimes with marine mammals. Um, we've developed a research program about the, the communication and language of uh, large cetaceans, mainly working with sperm whales. And so uh, the idea also is, again, to use freediving as a tool because a freediver is very um, silent, very discreet in the water, and usually the animal gets curious and uh, we can gain the confidence of the animals and uh, then we can make the investigation. Here you have... Um, a sperm whale observing uh, one of our uh, free diver in the team uh, was bringing uh, recording device. It's a 360 sound and video recording device. Uh, and we bring it close to the, to the whale to, to record uh, the behavior and the vocalization of the animal. And that's something only possible uh, with free diving. So the animals are very, very responsive to free divers. Usually they don't go away. They, they're very, um, very curious about free divers. And uh, the last thing we did uh, was this summer uh, in uh, northern Norway. Uh, we went to uh, visit that famous uh, beluga whale that appeared in the, the fjord last summer, uh, nicknamed Valdimir. Uh, it's probably... Um, uh, an animal that escaped from uh, maybe a military facility in uh, Russia because he was found with a harness on his back. And since then he's in the fjords and looking for human contact. Uh, the animal is really uh, friendly. Uh, and you can see because in northern Norway there's no um, other beluga, so he's looking for social contact. And uh, we spent three weeks there uh, recording vocalization and uh, try to, to match vocalization and behavior. Uh, very interesting animal. He's still around there. Uh, we'll probably get back next year. Uh, so again, something uh, where free diving can, um, can be useful. Uh, absolutely amazing experience to, uh, to free dive with that animal and trying to understand more about, uh, about him and why he's there and why he's looking for that human contact uh, while he's away from uh, his uh, big uh, friends and mates. Okay, so here uh, also uh, last year I got uh, into the a comic. Uh, I, I became a comic character here playing with the, the blue sharks in, in the Azores. So uh, you see free diving can take you uh, almost anywhere. Okay, thank you for, um, for listening.
So uh, now I don't know if um, you have questions. Uh, you. If anybody wants to, to ask some specific question, I'll be uh, totally happy to, uh, to answer. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much. So yes, there's a number of questions. You want to start, Mauricio, or should I start? Okay, let me ask the first. Uh, Fred, how deep do you free dive on the average while, sh while shark tagging? What's the deepest, what? What's the deepest you free dive to tag a shark? Okay, uh, so when we do shark tagging, the goal is not to go deep. And usually most of the work is done between zero and 20 meter and even zero and 10 meters. So it's not a question of depth. What's more important is to know the behavior of the animal. And that's where experience is useful because if you know the behavior of the animal, you know when it's going to come back, when it will be close to the surface. So you don't need to dive as deep. And so you save your strength. Like that, you can spend a lot of time in the water. You can spend all day without getting too tired. But sometimes, of course, we have to go deeper. And uh, I remember with, uh, doing an expedition in Revilla with uh, James. Uh, I tagged a um, uh, scallop hammerhead at 42 or 43 meters. Uh, so that was the deepest I, I tagged the shark, I mean, on, on free diving. Uh, but that's not very efficient because uh, if you dive uh, to those depths all day, you get very tired. And, um, and also you have less time at the bottom to choose your animal to have the right angle. So uh, it's better to work in shallower water. That's how it's more efficient. Uh, it says here in our question, uh, which is the most difficult species to tag for you uh, while free diving? Okay, the most difficult species might be um, the scallop hammerhead uh, in uh, Rivia because there's not many of them, they're very shy. So it's a very challenging animal to tag. Um, in Malpelo, for example, they're not as shy, so it's, they are very easy to tag, but in Revilla, uh, we noticed they, they're very shy and uh, it's difficult to tag them, so it's probably the most difficult. All the other sharks, uh, white shark is very easy, it's like a cow in a field, huh? they're very slow moving, you can take your time, uh, put the tag exactly where you want, the great hammerhead is very simple. Um, the black tip are very simple, the tiger sharks are super simple, but uh, all these uh, free swimming pelagic sharks such as scallop tamarid are a bit more uh, challenging. I would say. Okay, there, here we have another one. When you touch sharks, do they change their behavior? In fact, when you tag a shark, every time you've seen on the video, it gets, of course, it, it startles the shark because is hit by something, then he runs away. But uh, most of the time, uh, they are back a few minutes after. You know, they just run away and then you can see turn, them turn back and they come back with the tags and, like nothing happened. Uh, it's not, it's something very, uh, it's a short action. So it, I don't think it affects the, the behavior of the shark on the long term. And uh, it's just going to swim with that tag for a few months or a few years. But uh, the action itself doesn't uh, traumatize the shark. And I think that's why that methodology is very good instead of fishing, because sometimes when you fish the shark, that can be a bit um, traumatic for the animal. But uh, with the spear gun like that, it's just a little, it's like if someone pinch you with a, a small needle, you will be a bit startled, but 10 minutes after you forget. Here's a, here's a good question. Where's your favorite place to free dive? And what are your recommendations that you would give somebody to learn to free dive? <laughs> That's a big question. Uh -huh. Very difficult question because there's so many nice places. Uh, it depends what you look for. If you look for big animals, I would recommend the Eastern Pacific where you guys are based because in Revilla, Malpelo, all these places, you have so many big animals in one place. Uh, very good condition for diving. So that will be my, my choice. Then after, uh, if you just like deep blue waters, you have the Mediterranean Sea is wonderful. Here in Azores, we have a good compromise between the two because we have beautiful waters, uh, nice underwater structure with big drop-offs, but also we have pelagic uh, life. So uh, I would say it's really depending on what you look for. So many places. Okay, here we have one. Do you have a favorite animal? 
uh, your best friend underwater? Does the animal recognize you? That's a very good question. Uh, it's two parts. So my favorite, I don't know, I really like sperm whales uh, because you can have a very um, intimate bond with them. Uh, they're very clever animal, a very complex language, probably more complex than the human language. Very intelligent animal. It's the largest brain that ever been on earth. Uh, so you can have very, very good encounters with them. Uh, this winter with that bill guy, it was also a very good encounter. But with sharks also, you can have uh, very good encounters. And if you go to a place often, you will recognize the individual. Um, and I think sharks have a very strong personality. If you take a species of shark, if you take, for example, tiger sharks, they all behave like tiger sharks, which means, you know, they cruise, they're very opportunistic. If they see something, they will check you out. They will check something out. So that's the general behavior of a tiger shark. But every tiger shark has a special personality. Some are more attracted to the cameras, I've noticed. Some are totally, uh, they don't care. Some are more inquisitive, more uh, getting to touch people. So they, they all have their personality and also they can change. One day, one shark is very, uh, very peaceful and another day is a bit more uh, stressed. And uh, for example, in Guadalupe, we've noticed that. Uh, Mauricio can tell that as well. Uh, Sometimes you have very mellow sharks. They're known to be very mellow individuals, but one day you can see they're more, uh, you know, like us, one day you just wake up, you're not in good mood mm -hmm. and uh, you're pissed off all day. And uh, I think sharks are clever enough. I mean, they have enough intelligence to be able to have um, a behavior on, of their own. And also that behavior can be affected uh, daily. So that's very interesting to see again and again the same animals, to be able to recognize them just by the way they swim, by the attitude. Uh, and that, that's a very nice thing uh, to, to realize. Here's a good one. Uh, when diving with sharks, what safety measures do you take as a free diver? For instance, staying at surface, recovering breath can be dangerous. Okay, so first rule in free diving, never dive alone, never free dive alone. So always two people in the water. And when we work tagging, my favorite way of doing it is three people in the water. Uh, because if we are three people, one is taking care of the tagging, we only focus on that. One can document the work with a camera or a photo, photo camera. And then um, a third person can be really there just for the safety and looking what's happening around. And uh, I think that's the way to work. Um, it's not dangerous if it's made the, 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 the right way. And when you work with animals like white sharks, uh, that uh, system of three people works perfectly because you cover all the angles and everybody covers the back of someone else. And that works very well. Also, I hear a lot uh, that question about being at the surface with sharks when you free dive. A lot of people are worried that at the surface you're more vulnerable. I think it's a myth uh, because my take on that is that what's going to determine the encounter between you and the shark and the interaction you will have with the shark, it's your own behavior. If you are totally passive, you don't pay attention to what happened around you, the shark will come closer for sure and maybe investigate, touch you or even bite you, you never know. But if you are proactive in the water, you always look around, look in your back, the animal will understand that you know that he's there. You understand its presence. And that's my take on it. It's your attitude in the water that's going to determine the nature of the encounter. So always be proactive in the water. Uh, if a shark comes too close, swim a bit towards him, it will turn. Be proactive in the water. That's the, the most important advice I would say. And that's valid for every type of diving, not even with sharks, but every animal. It's a good one. Uh, what is your opinion on dolphins and marine mammals in captivity? How do you think the freediving community can join and advocate for this prohibition? Very interesting question, but very difficult to answer. In my opinion, I'm totally against. 
But my opinion changed. 10 years ago, you would have told me that. I would have said, it's not that bad because the small amount of marine mammals in delphinariums and marine parks, maybe it can be useful because you will get more people to see them and maybe realize they shouldn't be in captivity and all that. So it's, 10 years ago, I could have said it's a necessary evil. But nowadays, I think, with the knowledge we have of these animals and, and all that, it's not, um, it's not justified anymore. So we, we have to stop that. But there comes the other problem. What do you do if you stop everything? What do you do with these animals? You put them in the nature. You've seen it doesn't work. Uh, all the killer whales, for example, they've put back in, um, in the water. Uh, they've died of disease or they were totally socially disoriented. It doesn't really work. So, okay, you close everything, you stop the breeding, and, and then maybe you put all the animals that were in these delphinariums and marine parks into bays with nets in a semi-captivity until they pass away. That would be probably the solution. Uh, but also, maybe marine biologists can work with these animals you know, to, to know more about them, to, to study them, because anyway, they're not adapted to the to the wilderness and, uh, and that's a very complex uh, thing. And, and that shows also the problem in conservation with the extremist views, whether it's with marine mammals or other animals. Um, the human is still in the equation. We cannot say it's the nature and the humans and we cannot interact. It's a fact. We are all on the same planet. So at some point, we need to, to function together. And I think extreme position, it's not necessarily the way to go. And, uh, but of course, nowadays in 2020, you cannot justify to keep uh, intelligent uh, beings in, uh, in a tank for all their lives. So it should stop. Uh, the breeding programs should stop and it should slowly go down. Even for aquariums, you know, and there's more and more aquariums, uh, even with fish, even if they don't have marine mammals, they, they start to go into virtual uh, exhibitions, for example, and they're slowly letting go the aquarium itself. And they would like to have less fish in the tanks, but more exhibition and interactive things. You know, we have new technology with uh, 360 video, uh, all this infography, we can, you know, give the experience of the underwater world to people without being uh, necessary to put fish and dolphins in tanks. And uh, I think that's the future of these marine parks. It's to turn into more exhibition and, and, um, and gathering places instead of uh, prison for animals. And I think zoo will probably go that direction anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, needs, it takes time. We cannot do that in five years. It will take one full generation to change the, the point of view. Exactly. <clears throat> Here's a good one also. Uh, to dive with blue sharks and to help in conservation, what preparation as a free diver do you recommend? Depth, time, etc. What do you consider a good skill set to accomplish good results with blue sharks, I imagine? I think the only way is, is to spend time in the water. You know, uh, I started free diving when I was eight or nine. Uh, I dove with my I free dive with my first shark when I was 13 years old. And I started working with sharks when I was, what, 30, 35 almost. So, you know, it's a lot of experience. You need experience. And the problem nowadays uh, with uh, YouTube, social networks and everything, you think, you know, you see something on TV and then you're going to do that. Uh, I mean, it's like everybody, you know, you need to polish your skills. You need to spend time in the water. Uh, it's countless hours. It's, it's you know, uh, 250 days or 200 days in the water for 30 years. So uh, there's no miracle solution. Uh, it's like when you study something, uh, you need to put the years into it. And, uh, but the key is to spend time in the water with animals and uh, try to understand by yourself how do they function or you interact with them, and, uh, and then the skills will come naturally. Uh, but I don't see um, a miracle uh, recipe or solution to, to, to bypass the experience. 
uh, you need to spend time on the field in the water with animals. And then if you feel, you think you have a connection that can help, yeah, then go for it. But first, spend a lot of time on the field. I think that's the, the key. Yes, this is from one of our students. Hi, Fred. It's Marta Diaz from the Mini Modulus of La Paz. Do you think it will be possible to tag the little Munchianas with the harness as in the Azores? How heavy are those tags, having in mind that they are super shy and not very freediver friendly? Yeah. But maybe the, the, the key with the, the Mini Mobulas is that there's so many of them, you can probably go into school and, and succeed to, to tag one. Uh, the tag we use, um, I can send you the, the, the exact dimension of them. Uh, they're quite big because we work with big blue sharks and big mobilas. But I'm sure if we do a smaller version, and also I don't know matter what you need uh, in terms of sensor in the, in the tag, we have an accelerometer, we have uh, an acoustic beacon, we have uh, tons of sensor in it because we can put it on a big thing. But depending on what you study, if you put just one instrument, you could have a smaller tag, it's just a radio beacon, and I think it should be doable. The thing maybe with these mini mantas is that they, they go a lot in every direction, they're very fast, so maybe they can break the harness quicker, but it, it's worth, uh, worth a try. Huh? And uh, I'm sure in a, in a school you can easily uh, tag one, it should be possible, but with probably a smaller version of the, the tag, yes. Well, the harness. Here's a good one. How can someone who's a free diver get involved with tagging sharks? Well, it's exactly the, 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 the same answer I, I would give. Uh, first, spend time in the water with animals. If you're a spear fisher, okay, you probably have an advantage because you know how to shoot stuff. But we've seen also spear fishermen trying to go into the tagging, but it was not working properly. So, I mean, it's a personal connection with the animal, I think. Um, and then meeting the right people. And if the marine biologists you work with feel comfortable working with you, then I think the thing will happen naturally. Um, you know, like I did with, with you guys, we started uh, in Malpelo. We had no idea if it would work and we saw it was working. So we, we went a bit further and further. Uh, here in the Azores, when I arrived, it was the same. Uh, I didn't know the, the, the local marine biologists. They didn't know me. So it was a trust thing. We started to go free diving together first, just like that. And then we started to, uh, started to go with them when they were tagging. And I said, oh, maybe we should do like that. I said, oh, really? And then we developed the thing. But the relationship took a few years to develop. And uh, I think in our fast world, um, it's maybe uh, the, the, sometime the, the, the time to take your time and um, to get to know people, to get to know the animals and, and make a synergy that works well. Uh, it's something that takes time to, to develop. Um, and, and also it's two different set of competences, you know. Uh, I consider myself just a little link in the, in the chain. Uh, I have the good job because I just play and put the tag on the sharks. You guys have to analyze all, everything, so sorry. <laughs> all the fun stuff. So I have the good role. It's, it's easier for me, for sure. But I think everybody has this little place in the chain of, of that. And... Uh, it takes time to, to do, you know, 20 years ago, I would never think that I would be involved in these things. Uh, and it's funny because, uh, you know, I never study or anything. And sometimes now uh, I'm co-author of papers. It's kind of funny, but it took just time and it's just trust between people. But uh, uh, once again, spend time in the water with animals, spend time in the water with animals. That's the, the key. Excellent. Fred, how do you feel? A few more questions. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm totally okay. Okay, this is from a 10 year old. What is the most rare animal that you have tagged? Ah, ah but probably the ferox shark, the Ondostaspis ferox in Malpelo, because uh, it's a very elusive animal. Huh? There's only two or three places in the world when you can see him often. Uh, I think there's one place in uh, the Canary Island where in summer sometimes they come to a special sea mount and you can observe them, or Malpelo. And uh, otherwise, they're very deep sharks. They, we see them in, in Azores. Uh, we bump into one with submarine at 700 meters two years ago. 
uh, we didn't know they were here. <laughs> so uh, that's probably the most uh, special shock uh, I've tagged, of course. And also because it was a very special situation. Huh? We were on scuba at 90 plus meters to find them. And so a very, uh, very dodgy thing to do. Uh, but a very impressive animal. Yeah, that's probably the, the most difficult and elusive uh, shark I ever, uh, ever tagged, yes. Yeah, here's uh, also an interesting one. What would you say to decision makers regarding shark conservation needs or protection? Sorry, I didn't understand the first part. What would you say to decision makers regarding shark protection or conservation? Uh, but what we, we say all the time, uh, get them more protected and enforce the marine preserve because the problem is that we have marine preserve, governments say, oh, we've done a marine preserve, but they don't, we don't have the means to protect them. So first, just to enforce the actual legislation about fishing, about marine preserve. Here in Azores, we see we have long liners taking tons of blue sharks. There's no even quota in the EU for blue sharks. Uh, it's not enforced, uh, and that's in Europe. So imagine in uh, in very remote area uh, in the in the Pacific. How can you enforce that? So yes, to the policy maker, I say enforce the marine protected area, enforce the regulation that are already in place for fishing. Just that would help a lot. And of course, for the fishing industry, we should stop subsidies, uh, giving subsidies subsidies to these uh, to the fishing fleet. In Europe, uh, all these offshore fishing fleet wouldn't be able to function without uh, the money from the EU. They couldn't even pay the fuel with what they, they get. So uh, that's the key also, you know, to stop all kind of funding uh, coming from the state to these uh, things, you know, and, and that would already make a big difference. Uh, but it's so difficult to achieve. Uh, so much lobbying going there against that, uh, it's, it's a very, very complex situation. And in, in Europe here, I know even in the, you know, Mexico or in the Pacific, it is even worse, but even in Europe here, we, it's so much lobbying and, and, and bribes and, and things that these fishing fleets are, are really harvesting everything with the, 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 the help of the EU because they, they pay for the fuel, they pay for everything. They pay for the boats, uh, but the, the, the fishing industry by itself wouldn't be able to survive without that. So I think we have to ask ourselves the question, do we still need a fishing fleet in Europe? You know, uh, It's a big question, but for the future, for sure, we need to get rid of that. It's, it's not for the, the probably 10,000 10, jobs in Europe that it provides. We have to stop that. We have to stop that. Right, this is a very good question, and this could answer why your help is so important for us, for scientists. Have you ever noticed that shark behavior is different when the sharks are with scuba divers than free divers? Yes, of course. That's, the, that's a very important thing. And I started to notice that uh, with underwater photography. When I started underwater photography, I was able to... Um, photograph animals or behaviors that scuba divers, photographer couldn't get uh, because with the bubble, you make a lot of noise. And then you had photographers using rebreathers. You don't make noise, but you're not mobile in the tricky dimension like a free diver is. So of course, free diving is a big plus for that. And the fact we are totally silent and uh, don't make bubble. Um, in fact, we don't have to go behind the animals. The animal come to us. So uh, for, for, for taking picture, filming or tagging is the perfect situation because you just wait for the animal to visit you and because they are curious and then you do what you have to do. So it's a, it's a big plus uh, for sure. And also it's less logistics. You can spend more time in the water than a scuba diver uh, because during a day a scuba diver can do two or three dive maximum. We can spend six, seven hours. Uh, like with James in Revilla, we were spending sometimes seven hours a day uh, trying to find animals. So, yeah, in my opinion, it's a big plus. But some stuff you need scuba to do, some stuff you need a rebreather. It's one more tool uh, for the scientist, you know, and it's a tool you, you have to use. 
Here's another one. What is your opinion on wrangling white sharks and in consequence feeding them? And the other questions, and, uh, and the other question is, and of the recent accidents in Guadalupe. So it's always the, the problem with tourism and ecotourism. Uh, it's good to a certain point. Uh, I mean, if you have 10 boats in the same bay baiting and, and working with white shark, you will get into trouble because you will then really probably affect the, the behavior of the sharks. Um, and you will have incidents because you have more, I mean, statistics, you know, if you have more cage in the water, uh, more sharks coming close, more sharks going after the bait, you have more chance to have at some point a shark getting into a cage and getting stuck. It's inevitable. And uh, the more boats you have, the more people you have, the more chances you have to have an incident like that. So maybe the question is maybe to reduce again the, the, the amount of boats. And it's valid everywhere. You know, we, we see here in Azores in summer, we have um, a lot of whale watching. It's affecting the, the behavior of the whales, for sure. So, but would you restrain? And then the government say no, because they make money off the licenses. It's always the same problem. And the problem, humans are not able to regulate themselves. You know, say, okay, we shouldn't do that. So it's a, it's a complex question. But for me, yes, we, ecotourism is good, but it needs to be a very small operation. And uh, it needs to, to be very well um, enforced, uh, very well regulated. And I think you should, uh, when you're an operator, it, it's a question of quality in, against uh, the numbers. You know, uh, maybe take less people, but um, with a better experience and you will have a more successful business instead of doing rotation after rotation and, and, and putting as many people you can in the water. Uh, it's always a problem with tourism. You need a bit of tourism, but too much is a problem. Um, so, so yes, and I don't know how deep it's affecting the, I don't think it's affecting the, the feeding behavior of the animals. Because, you know, sharks, they're very opportunistic feeders. If they have free food, they will take it. But if the boat leaves, uh, they will keep on hunting. Uh, it won't change their behavior forever. Huh? Uh, for them, it's just a bonus, and the boats are not there every year. But when the boats are there, for sure, it's affecting the, the behavior of the animals. So that's a, that's a fact. Yeah, just to talk a little bit more about this, uh, we are working together with the Mexican government, and they are very concerned about all this. So we have been working in a very important document that is called PASE, which is for very specific species in Mexican waters. And also we are part of the new good management plan for Guadalupe Island. So we want to have that, this before the, the season starts. So CONAM, which is Comisión de Áreas Naturales Protegidas, has been very eager in, in developing this before the season. So they, are, they know that this is important. Here we have one very good question, uh, Fred. How do you see the technology for tagging and acoustic devices developing in the next decade? <laughs> But we've seen that in the last decade, there was a lot of improvements. Uh, when you, we see when we started with these uh, very basic acoustic things and then the satellite tagging. And, but now, I mean, we have so many tools and the electronics is getting smaller. Like on these platform tags, we can have six or seven sensors, cameras. We have infrared cameras. It's stuff we couldn't even dream of uh, five or 10 years ago. So I guess with the, the electronics getting smaller and more, uh, with more potential, we'll have much better tags. Um, and then we can change the methodology and what we study also. Uh, so of course it's ev evolving. And also there's more and more manufacturer which makes concurrent between them. And uh, I think that's good to have several brands that are competing there and uh, developing uh, their own systems. Um, but for sure, uh, it's like computers and phones, uh, it's, it's, it's going fast. Uh, every year we see little improvements and uh, the technology we were thinking top of the line three, four years ago uh, has changed. I mean, you know that even better than, I, than me because we work with that every day. And, uh, and also I think the input of the scientists, when the scientists work with this equipment and give feedback to the manufacturer, they say, oh, we would like that feature. And maybe the manufacturer didn't think about that feature and add it on the next generation of tags. 
So uh, yeah, it will open doors uh, for sure. Just the battery, yeah? the battery life changed a lot in the last 10 years. Uh, 10 years ago was what, one, two years maximum for a battery. Now we can have tags uh, lasting for almost 10 years. So uh, of course it, it will improve, huh? for sure. There's another one. Uh, it says, uh, congratulations for your work. Congratulations for using your fun and abilities to contribute with science. Where do you tag the sperm whale? How deep from the surface it was and how long it took you to tag it? Sperm whale. We don't tag sperm whales. Uh, I never tag the whale and I will never tag a whale because I don't see myself getting into the water and uh, shoot uh, a shaft as a, to a dolphin or whale <laughs> or whatever. So we don't tag whales. Uh, we just uh, record uh, um, sound with a 360 sound recording system and match it with 360 uh, camera rig uh, to match sound and behavior. Uh, so it's totally non-invasive. We don't put anything on the whale. We don't take anything from the whale. And uh, no, I wouldn't see myself uh, tagging a whale by shooting something at a whale or a dolphin. No, that won't happen. Uh, so uh, it's just to take sound and images, nothing more, nothing less. So maybe yeah, the last two questions, Fred. Uh, are you involved yeah. with teaching or tagging by free diving? Uh, no, not really. But uh, sometimes people, uh, you know, when we're in the water, ask me how it works here. Like for example, with a local scientist, uh, you know, when we developed that lasso thing, they had. They didn't know we could do that, so they were a bit skeptical. We did the first prototype, and then uh, I did it. After two minutes, I could put it in the water. So they said, okay, it's possible. And so they started to think it's possible. It's, I think it's when you see someone doing something, you say, okay, it's possible. It's just psychological barriers, and then you, you move on. Um, but like when I started tagging on free diving, I had no idea if it was doable. But I, I saw that people were doing it in, on scuba, so why not doing it on, on free diving? So um, no, there's no specific course and also there's no market for that. I mean, all the work I do uh, for, for scientists is totally um, on a, a volunteer basis. So uh, it's just helping, giving time and, and, and a bit of knowledge, that's all. So, um, and there's not that many teams in the world that need to tag sharks free diving. So uh, it's not, uh, if you want to invest in a, in, uh, in a course for a job, I don't think it's the best job in the world uh, in terms of uh, if you want to make your living out of that. Um, so it's, for me, it's just an add-on. It's, uh, it's a side activity I do because also for me, when I do that, it allows me to document the work so I can take video pictures that uh, for me is good because I can make stories uh, from that. And also the, the scientific teams I work with, they have material, they can... Uh, they can show to people. So uh, it's also important for that reason. Yeah? Fred, uh, the last question, uh, Pedro Almeida, he says, Fred, I'd like to help you in the Azores. Are, is free diving needed for that? If so, how, how can I get involved as a free diver? Uh, well, uh, just check with the university people here in Orta and, and see if they, they need uh, more people uh, for the, the diving operation. Uh, that's the, the best uh, advice I, I can give. Uh, like I, I did myself, I was in touch with the people and, and then we decided to, to start doing that. Uh, but yes, I think the best is to go and see the people. And, uh, and then start maybe to go diving with them and see each other's skills and see if you get on well with the people. And then uh, seeing if you have uh, an added value to the, the team and then they develop a relation and, and start to work. I think that's the way to do it. Take time and, um, and things will flow naturally. Yeah? It's, in every uh, human relation, I think that's the way to, to develop it. Nice. Well, Fred, many, many thanks for your time, for this great presentation. Uh, we really liked it. And is there a final comment you want to give to your audience? Because there's still a lot of people here connected. Well, thank you for uh, welcoming me here, uh, the team of Pelayos. Of course, it's always a pleasure to, to work with you and being able to collaborate with you. I had so many great times with you uh, in the Eastern Pacific in the last 12, 15 years. 
And uh, of course, thanks to all the people following that. And uh, like we were discussing before we started the presentation, I think that uh, pandemic uh, was a good thing for that to develop all these uh, online tools to be able to connect people from all over the world. Um, instead of uh, you know flying to one place to do a, a seminar or something, here you know we have people from all over the world following that presentation, and uh, and also we should take the opportunity of that pandemic and the way it affected the world, which is totally interconnected. And we saw that the one little virus uh, could cut a lot of links in the supply chain in the way we we interact with the world. Maybe it's a good opportunity to question ourselves and the way we live and uh, how we, we trash our ocean and nature. And maybe it's time to uh, reduce our footprint. Uh, so use that, uh, that special time to, to rethink uh, your uh, position and your uh, relation with the, the world. Uh, it sounds big words, but uh, if we don't do it now, we will never do it. So. Uh, that would be the, the last comment I would say. Well, many thanks, uh, Fred. This was great. And muchas gracias a todos por participar. Eh, la próxima semana, next week, we have another presentation as the final of a series for this month. Uh, it's going to be about the Spirit to Santo Island and the shark research we've been doing there in the last years. La próxima semana tenemos una presentación sobre el Parque Nacional Espíritu Santo y la investigación de los tiburones eh, en los últimos años en ese parque y aquí tenemos la en la pantalla el este la diapositiva de los del programa de internships de, de estancias científicas en pelagios no deben contactarnos esta presentación se va a subir al youtube this presentation will be in our youtube channel as we said at the beginning muchas gracias a todos mauricio gracias fred thank you very much Hawks from thank you guys and uh, see you next time or in Mexico pretty soon. Thank you very much. Yes. Muy buen día. Thank you. Gracias. Cheers. Bye.